As you open, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. Let's pray when you get there. We'll, we'll pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes as we just sang. Well, Father, we thank you for your word, a precious gift indeed, the truth. And as we study here today and as we look into your word, we ask indeed that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes, would illumine our minds to see more clearly Jesus Christ and that you would cause us to love him with more passion, to, to serve him with all of our energy and to make him known in this world by going and serving and speaking and loving as you would have us. So Father, open our eyes to see Christ as we look at John chapter 7. To that end we pray, amen. John chapter 7. And as we continue working through our way through this gospel that we started some time ago, we find ourselves in chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, or actually 24, 17 through 24. And as you find yourself there, I want to read the text first to put this in our mind before we work through there. So in John chapter 7, verse 14 through 24, the word of God says, But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus again said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Verse 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. If you notice in verse 24 there, our Lord gives two commands to his listeners and thus to us who are reading. These are the only imperatives of this passage. He's exhorting them to stop judging according to what they see merely and to start and to always judge righteously. It is a call to discernment. It is a charge to take what Jesus says and what he does and decide for yourself that they are true according to the truth, according to the scripture, according to God's revelation. We are to take the claims of Jesus and make a decision on the veracity of his words and his works. He demands that we come to a verdict concerning the truthfulness of his teaching and his actions. We are to judge whether or not he is from God, to decide whether he is who he says he is or not. He does not allow us the option of indifference. He does not accept agnostic, that is to be without knowledge. I just don't know. Undecided, no, that's not an option. He demands a verdict, does Jesus. Do you accept his claims or not? I'm afraid there are many people who attend church all over the board, all over the globe, even Bible-believing Bible preaching churches that exalt Christ as Lord, people who sit in pews and hear the awesome truths of Christ from the Bible and remain unmoved. I mean, in their heart of hearts, they have not come to a final settled conclusion as to who is Christ. Is he actually God? Are his words and his works from God? Therefore, to be obeyed, they like some of his sayings, but not all of them. We saw this in John 6, didn't we? They like his miracles of mercy, healings, feeding people, but perhaps they have trouble believing his power to walk on water or to raise the dead or even his own resurrection. 
In the depth of their hearts, they really don't believe. Oh, they, they would never say a despairing word about him. They, they go to church every Sunday. At least not out loud, they wouldn't say anything despairing about Jesus. They would defend, they would, that he is a good man. He tried to do good. He tried to better society. He came and tried to show us all how to be better neighbors, how to live a good and godly life, concerned for others. They would say he's a good moral teacher. Now to the folks of this view of Jesus, they ignore, they reject the awesome claims that he makes. They pick and choose like a buffet what they will accept of his teachings and what they will reject. I like this, but I don't like that. And then they disregard what they don't like as though it's irrelevant. You see, his lordship is greatly resented and any demands put on them are rejected because they do not believe that Jesus really is God, that his words are from God and they don't believe his works are from God. But these churchgoers will say, and even those outside the church who want to say something good about Jesus, they'll say he's a good man, a good moral man, but certainly not God, certainly not Lord, and so therefore no real authority over my life today. Commentator William Hendrickson compiled a list of claims that I want to share with you I came across And I want you to listen to these claims. It's going to go rapid fire. But these are the claims that demand a verdict. He claimed, says Jesus, to have come down from heaven. He claimed to have been sent into the world by the Father. Numerous times in the Gospel of John, we read that. The one who sent me. He claimed to be the Savior of the world. The one and only Savior of the world. He claimed to be the determiner of people's eternal destinies. To believe in him is to be saved. To reject him is to be damned. He claimed to be the source of eternal life. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed to have the right to be honored on an equal basis with the Father. He claimed to be one with the Father. He claimed to have power to raise the dead, to even rise from the dead himself. He claimed to be the one to whom the Old Testament scriptures pointed and find their fulfillment. He claimed to be the the supreme judge who will one day return in glory. Jesus claimed to be without sin, to have all authority in heaven and on earth, to have the authority to forgive sins, to have authority over the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. To have authority to answer prayer. He claimed to have the authority to authorize prayer in his name. Ask anything in my name and you shall have it. He claimed to be greater than the temple in Jerusalem. He claimed to be better than Jonah, greater than Solomon, greater than Jacob, and greater than Abraham, the father. Equal with God, he claimed. In John 6, we saw how he claimed to be the bread of life. He's the only source of spiritual sustenance. He claimed to be the light of the world, the only light of the world. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. He claimed to be the the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God who would be seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. He claimed that he'd be coming again in the glory of his Father and his holy angels. You see, there's only three possible explanations for these amazing claims that Jesus made. Either he was a deranged madman a diabolical deceiver, or exactly who he claimed to be. Those are your options. He could not possibly have merely been a good moral teacher for such people do not make the kind of claims that Jesus made. I found a a quote of C.S. Lewis embedded in the commentary, and Lewis writes this, C.S. Lewis notes, quote, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. 
but let, not, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. That is not an option. He did not intend to. You see, either he is Lord or he's a myriad of other things. We must come to a verdict, must come to the right verdict of who is Jesus. And to come to the right verdict is to have eternal life. So as we come to our text in John chapter 7, we look in verses 14 through 24. Jesus Christ, we know, comes to the Feast of Booths which is to come to Jerusalem. It's one of the three great feasts that's required of every Jewish male to attend in Jerusalem the feast. So there's hundreds of thousands of people who are coming here for a week-long festival called the Feast of Booze. Jesus Christ comes to this feast in spite of great hostilities that we've been reading since verse one, and, and the hatred for him is intensifying And though the religious leaders were seeking to kill him, Jesus went up into the temple, and we'll read, began to teach publicly and boldly. And he goes before them, does Jesus, and he confronts his enemies with their wrong assessments about him. They said he was a deceiver, a false teacher who sought his own glory, that he had a demon, was deranged and delusional, that he was a good man, some might say, but just that just a good man with good intentions. But he comes, does Jesus, in obedience to the Father and graciously speaks before them, his enemies, the truths that when believed will deliver them from eternal judgment. From this text, you see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though they want to kill him, he comes before them and speaks words that if they believe and come to the right assessment, they will be delivered from eternal hell. This is the grace of God. To come to the right verdict of Jesus is to have eternal life. And if you look at our text in verses 14 through 18, he claims, these are what we need to see these claims and come to the right verdict. Jesus claims that the words that he speaks are from God. 14 through 18. In verses 19 through 23, he says that he he claims that his works are from God. And finally, in verse 24, he will give a command. He commands us to come to the right decision. So look at verse 14. Here is his teaching is from God, he claims. And the scene that we see is in verse 14. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach Notice it's the middle of the feast. This is a week-long festival. He comes day three or four in the middle of this feast. He comes unannounced because it's not his time yet. Some months from here, the Passover of the next year, four or five months ahead, the triumphal entry is going to be recorded in Matthew 21 and a week before the festival of the Passover. He will come in full flower, full announcement, because that's the day, that's the time he's to be crucified. This is before that time. He comes in the middle of the feast, unannounced. And he comes there in verse 14, if you see. There's thousands of people from all over the world who are attending this feast. Jesus comes into the temple. Remember, the temple is the centerpiece of the Jewish religious life at this time. Throngs of people milling around. And what is his purpose of going there in verse 14? He began to teach. Now, this is what the rabbis of the day would do. They they would find a convenient place to teach the worshipers who are coming there to the temple. Very convenient place. Very, um, you can get a crowd easily there. That's what rabbis did. Jesus is there with thousands of people milling around in and out. He's bold enough and loud enough and finds a place and begins to teach. Here he is teaching. And it doesn't say what he's teaching, but we can surmise from previous texts in John and even from the other Gospels that I'm sure he's beginning to preach. He's teaching here in the temple about the coming kingdom of God and the righteousness and judgment, his Messiahship, perhaps even demanding them to follow him exclusively, take up your cross and follow me. For instance, listen to in John chapter 5, just perhaps something along these lines. He says this in John 5, 21 through 24, when he was here before, a year, year and a half earlier. 
For just as the Father raises the dead, Jesus says to them, and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Wow. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father, on equal grounds with God the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Perhaps he's preaching that again. Or perhaps it's John 6, 35, and we saw in the previous text, or previous chapter, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. What a promise. The God-man comes into the temple. Remember, the temple is a place designated and set apart as the dwelling place of the true God of heaven on earth. God designed it, and God said, this is where I will dwell. And here comes the Son of God and begins to teach the word of God in this earthly temple. And he's teaching these, he's teaching. Now, because he's bold, and that which is teaching, if it's believed, brings eternal life. But these people hate him. The Jews want to kill him. But he's there teaching in their temple. And in verse 15... The Jews who hate him, look at their assessment here. They're they're astonished in verse 15. As they listen to his words, they marvel, but not for the right reason. They're not marveling at the content of what he's saying, at the glorious truths of what's coming from his mouth, what he's laying out before them, but they, they marvel at his lack of education. He didn't go to the right seminaries. He didn't go to my seminary, right? They were astonished that this hick from Galilee could speak with intelligence, that he could articulate scripture and ideas even though he did not go to their rabbinical schools. It's like they're astonished. Like, how can he speak like this? How does he know these things? And how can he put these ideas together? Later on in the chapter, the off, in verse 45, they said something like this. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers said in 46, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. So the, just not only the way he speak, but how he was such, without quoting other rabbis and other commentaries, he spoke with such authority because he's God And they never heard anybody speak like this. And he spoke with such confidence and was able to articulate. But they're not moved by what he's saying. They are marveling that he's able to say something at all that's intelligent because he's uneducated. This is a way to resist the truth. You can justify your resistance if you can belittle the speaker. Right? He's just a hick. He's just a cowboy. (laughs) Right? Jesus is from Nazareth, a little country town. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He didn't learn from their rabbis. He doesn't even quote their rabbis. He quotes God, right? Now, after the resurrection, the same thought will be placed onto the apostles by the same Jewish people when they're speaking in the temple in Jerusalem. And in Acts 4, listen to what it says here. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed, they marveled, and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus, who they also claimed to be uneducated, right? The elites reject the truth in our text because of the arrogance in their mind that the person speaking is not from the same level that I am, you see. And so they, it's like, it's irrelevant. They should have been marveling at the truth that came from the Son of God. So out of hatred, they scoff him and accuse him of being a self-taught, untrained, false prophet. But then Jesus responds, and notice what he says. His response is awesome. It's like he doesn't even hear what they're saying so much. And he says this, 
in verse 16, his words that he says are from God. He says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Fascinating. The words that I am speaking to you did not originate from me. These are not my own inventions. These are not my own ideas. I didn't come up with them on my own. I'm not contrary to God. I'm not absent from God. I'm not distinct from God in this sense. The words that I'm speaking are not mine. They're his. It's interesting that Jesus, isn't it, that he's emphasizing here his submission to the Father. The words I speak are not mine. Not only is the teaching from the Father, but look at the rest of that verse. Whose are they? But his who sent me. Again, emphasizing his submission to God. Not only is the teaching from the Father, but also Jesus is the one sent, and the Father is the sender. So it's interesting, we see just in the passing here, the relationship of the Trinity, the inter-Trinitarian relationship of the Father and the Son, and the Son in in his incarnation has been sent from heaven to earth. And Jesus says, the one who sent me from there to here is the one whose words I'm speaking. And they mock him as an uneducated, untrained hick. So why would I listen to anybody who's an uneducated, untrained hick? Jesus says, my words are not mine. They're his. They're his. I think it's fascinating from this that I I want to blast through here. The father and the son are one, but they're not the same. There's all kinds of heresies out there that say the father is the father, and then when he takes that hat off and puts the son's hat on, he's the son, but they're the same person. They're not the same person. One God, three persons. That's fascinating. Jesus says, my teaching's not mine, distinct, but they're one. Jesus always is talking, the father and I are one. The oneness is true, their unity but they are distinct. It's fascinating. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with, with God and the word was God, right? So there's your distinction in union. It's, it just, it's constantly pours out of the scripture. So Jesus, in response to their scoffing, says The teaching that you're rejecting is not mine, but is the one who sent me. I have been commissioned. I have come from heaven to speak his words. So to reject Jesus' words is to reject the Father's. Repeatedly, Jesus in John, Jesus says, the one who sent me. The Father commissioned the Son, and the Son in submission came. Look at verse 28 of chapter 7. He says, this will be next week, but then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I am from and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true whom you do not know, the one who sent him. In John 8, 42, listen, Jesus said to them later on in John 8, 42, if God were your father, you would love me. Why? For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come of myself, but he sent me. Jesus didn't come in self-determination. He came in submission to the Father, and he came. And the Father is always seen as the one who is the sender. And Jesus, in submission, the Son came. The words that he speaks are from God. John 8, 26. Listen now. I have many things to say, says Jesus and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I am saying to the world. If the Father who he referenced there is true, the words I hear from the one who is true, the words I'm speaking then are what? True. If you disregard Jesus' words, or you, like a buffet, pick and choose the ones you don't like and you don't choose, you're rejecting God the Father whose word Jesus is speaking, okay? 
And this is what he's boldly saying in the temple to these people, right? It's just fascinating. In John 12, 49, we read at the call of worship, listen to verse 49. For I did not speak from myself. Jesus is repeatedly saying this. But the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment, has given me, the Son, a commandment say, to say and to what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. He's faithfulness to the Father. Therefore, he speaks only what he hears the Father tell him to speak. And the Father is true. Therefore, the words that Jesus speaks that we have recorded down is divine heavenly truth. And he says it unashamedly. This is a bold claim to say to those who want to kill you. (laughs) He speaks only the word of God, his Father. He is echoing his word. To hear Jesus is to hear the Father. To receive the words of the Son is to receive the words of the Father, and this is to have eternal life. We have his word in Scripture right here. But it's interesting. How does one come to believe? How does one come to know that these words, the Scriptures and the words from Jesus, that are from God? He can say that. How do we know they are true? Jesus, think of this, Jesus preached basically to all of Israel, but very few comparatively believed in him. What is it, the next one at the upper room is 120 people, right? So there's, of the hundreds of thousands in Israel, there's a very few number that believed in Jesus over his ministry, probably spoke to almost all the Jews. Think of how many millions of people have read the Bible over the centuries never to believe its testimony about Jesus. How does one come to be convinced that this, what they are hearing, if you were in the stands listening to Jesus or reading his word, how do you come to believe that this, what he says, is true? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 17. He tells us how to validate his claims. It's not from rigorous debate. You don't sit down with the Jesus Club over in Santa Rosa and Choose which sayings we like, which are true and which are false based on our opinion. God's truth is not found in rigorous debate. It's not finally determined by a council of humans. That doesn't mean you don't throw out scriptures and argue scripture. I'm not saying that. But whether this is true or not is not finally determined by my heart, by my mind. It's received. It's received. Think of this. Before one's converted, the Bible's just, depending on their background, let's just say he's just a pagan like I was. The Bible's just a book full of stories. It's like, yeah, it's a good story, (laughs) you know? But I'm not going to follow it. It's not the Word of God, it doesn't have any relevance to my life. And then all of a sudden, God comes, metaphorically knocks you off your horse and lightning bolts you. And now you believe that Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross, was buried and resurrected and is alive today and loves me enough to save me. How in the world did you come to that conclusion? Through, through countless hours of, of contemplation and just wrestling through the Bible? No, by divine revelation, he came and all of a sudden you believed. How do you explain the Apostle Paul? Right? He's killing Christians and God actually, intentionally, knocks him off his horse and blinds him for three days. And then he gets up and goes to preach Christ in the synagogues where he was going to go to kill Christians. How do you explain that, right? Other than divine, sovereign grace, omnipotent mercy, transformation. Opens their eyes. How do we get there? But look at how it's it's stated here. I say all that to say this. (laughs) Look at verse 17. If anyone is willing to do his will. Fascinating phrase. The will, if anyone is willing. 
Remember, uh, is it Matthew 23 when Jesus stood outside Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you were unwilling to come. Unwilling. This says if anyone's willing to do, if, if in your heart of hearts, if you're willing to do, to practice, practice what? Look what it says. 17, his will. His refers to 16, which would be the one who sent Jesus. His is God the Father. So if anyone is willing to obey, to put into practice, to live by, do the will of God the Father, what does Jesus promise in verse 17? Look what it says. He will know of the teaching. To know you will be convinced experientially. You will have tasted of this message. And the conclusion will be in 17 as to whether this is of God or not. You will say, that is truth. How do you know? I don't know. I just know. When God saved me, I'm just experientially, endure me, would you? For 30 years, I was a rank pagan. God saved me through some things, uh, circumstances. And I, since he saved me, I have never doubted that this is true. And people ask, well, how do you know? I don't know (laughs) how I know. I just know that I know. That sounds like circular reasoning. But you know why it isn't? It's not determined by you. It's given to you. This gift of knowing the truth is a gift of grace, but it's given to anyone willing to do God's will. That's fascinating. I heard it said once by Dr. Fox that God does not throw his pearls before his wine, right? And what he meant by that, that if you're not willing to do what God says, he ain't gonna illumine your mind to the truth. He will not throw pearls before his wine. I think he's right. This is what Jesus is saying to his enemies who are mocking him because he's uneducated. He says, my teaching's from heaven. It's not even mine. How do we know you're true? You're just from Nazareth. Here you are. Jesus says, here's how you validate it. Are you willing to do the will of God? Are you willing to do it, put it into practice? If you're willing to put it into practice, you will know by a gift of grace that this is true that this is from God, that this is from God. That's fascinating. So think about it. If if, if you're not willing to do, if you're in in this arrogant stance of criticism, of unbelief, and I, and God knows our hearts, right? It's, he's not going to do it. Therefore, I'm not going to tell him, right? But you know, what's interesting What about the will? (laughs) We've been learning a lot about the will, haven't we? Think of this. (laughs) We're learning here that the will to do precedes the knowledge, okay? it's It's not, I must know. It's not like being from Missouri, right? Show me state. I'm not budging one inch, cowboy, unless you show me the truth of this thing. No, 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 no. No. Jesus is just the opposite. Jesus says it's like this. If you're willing to do it, I will show you. You see, so the heart is before the knowledge. It's fascinating. So it's not a matter of argumentation. It's a moral issue. To do the will of God is to, is to not Rebel, it's to not sin. It, it, you know, it, sin is transgression against God's law. He says, if you're willing to do that which God wants you to do, I will show you the truth. You will know that this is true. That, what an awesome thing. Okay, now get this. How did that happen? To will to do God's will. How did that happen? The will, we've learned so much from the scriptures, right? In the last few months, especially here, we've been 
in texts and in classes that are emphasizing the will of fallen man? Is the will of fallen man free or is it bound in something? Speak to me. (laughs) It's bound. It's bound in sin. It's bound in darkness. The will of fallen man unto himself hates God. Scripture tells, tells us that. We're hostile to God. Isn't that true? The, the fallen man, the natural man, hates God in their heart of hearts. There's no love for God, no love for Christ. The world does not seek and desire to honor God. They wish God would go away. That's the heart of every fallen, unregenerate person. The will of man is enslaved to sin and darkness under the sway of the devil to do his will, uh, Timothy says. But this says here, if anyone's willing, he will know. Can I have you go back to chapter 6? And Pastor Max went through this a few weeks ago so gloriously. But I just want to read three verses here in chapter 6 to set this in our mind again. Look at verse 43, just to pick it up in the middle of a section here. But look at 43 through 45. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. They're really having trouble with the idea that he came from heaven. Okay, 44. Okay, he says, don't grumble, but look at 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I raise him up on the last day. Okay, very clearly, right? No one means what? No one. Right? You don't have to know Greek to know that one, right? In Espanol, it's nada, right? It's nobody, right? Nobody's coming unless the Father's drawing. It's like drawing water out of a well, It's like siphoning hose, right? Get that siphon going. That's what God does to every single person who is a Christian, like a siphoning hose. He siphons you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. No one can come unless the Lord siphons you. (laughs) Can I use that phrase, okay? Now, look at this, verse 45. Look at verse 45. It is written, to, to substantiate verse 44, 45, it is written, so scripture says this, in the prophets, and they, the ones who come, shall all be taught of God. Now get this. Look at the next line. Everyone, again, that's Greek for everyone, who has heard and learned, been taught from who? The Father. Do you see that? God the Father has spoken to, heard, and learned from, he taught them what is the result of his teaching. 45. Speak to me. Comes to me. That's the siphoning. That's just another perspective of the siphoning. The father who draws. How did he draw? The father in divine intervention through the Holy Spirit speaks to this heart and convinces them, teaches them that Jesus is who he says he is and they come to Christ. If God don't do that, you ain't a coming. You're staying in the bucket, <laughs> right? The siphon lost its suction, it's gone, right? It ain't happening, but God makes it happen. If anyone is willing, stop parentheses, the only one who's willing is the one whom God has taught, verse 45. He changes your will. He changes your will. Our section is coming from a human perspective, if anyone's willing. We learn from chapter 6, from divine perspective. Yeah, but God is the one drawing. I'm moving because God is drawing, but all you see is me moving. I'm coming to Christ. Why? My will has been changed, freed up, By grace, by the power of God, he's freed up my will. I no longer see God as an enemy. Immediately right now, I see him as someone I want to please. I want to obey him. God says, anyone who is that way will know that the truth that I'm speaking is from heaven. That's how you know the Bible's the Bible. And it's true because of grace. 
It's a gift of God. You don't, you don't determine this. He gives it to you. Right? He gives it to you. Wow. That's awesome. D.A. Carson, who's way too smart and writes some tough things to read sometimes, but he has a great quote on this, if I share with you. D.A. Carson writes this. Divine revelation can only be obsessed, assessed, assessed, as it were, from the inside. From that perspective, the person who chooses to do God's will discovers that Jesus' teaching articulates it and that Jesus does not speak on his own but as the word of God. That's from inside. It's a gift of God. The spirit of God. You can't explain that. That's why atheists accuse us of circular reasoning, right? But it's not circular reasoning. How do we prove it? By willing to do it. And when we do it, we learn, by golly, Jesus is who he says he is. That's what he's saying here. This so, and he's saying it to his enemies. That's what I love about it. He nails them. Back to chapter seven if he wandered away like I did. Now, further evidence that Jesus' words are true is found in the next verse 18. Look at what it says in verse 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. The one who speaks his own stuff naturally is gonna seek glory for himself. If you just listen long enough, you will learn the goal of the speaker, right? They speak about everything but Jesus and, and his glory. They don't, they don't seek God's glory. The dreaded eye problem keeps coming up, right? You know what I mean by that, right? I, 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 it's all about me, it's all about me, all about me. Um, Jesus is always deflecting to the Father, but when he does speak of I, it's because he's worthy of I because he's God. But the text is emphasizing this. Jesus did not come for his glory. He came for the Father's glory. Do you see there in 18? He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Remember, they accused him of speaking from themselves, from himself. He said, no, I, my, tr my truth comes from the Father. And, and then he goes on to say in 18, to, to distinguish himself from these Pharisees, from these Jews, because the Jews sought glory for themselves. They love, you know, toot their own horn on the street corners. Watch me now, I'm giving to the poor, did you want to see it again? Here I am, right? Oh, I'm praying now. You want to, want to watch me? I'm praying now. I'm pious, right? That's what the Pharisees did. Toot their own horn, Matthew 5 and 6. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus came before the enemies who want to kill him, and he's teaching them truth from the Father, and he's pointing them to the Father. I didn't come to seek my own glory like you guys do. Look at, the next, look at this middle half of verse 18. He contrasts himself here. Notice what he says. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, that being himself, right? The one who sent him is the father. The one who seeks the one who sent him. That person, he goes on to say of himself in this kind of third person, he says, he is true and there's no unrighteousness in him. Right there, he claims to be the truth, and sinless. He claims right there, I seek the glory of the one who sent me. Therefore, I am true because he is true. And he's perfect. He says, I am sinless. I'm without sin. Wow. It is the, it is, it, Jesus is saying here, and we see it throughout the gospels, that his habit is to seek the praise and the honor and the glory of his father. The teaching comes from the Father, therefore the glory goes to the Father. And this sets Jesus apart from all these other Jews because they seek their own glory, not God's glory. Jesus is genuine, Jesus is faithful, Jesus is real, Jesus is true, he's pure and he's perfect, he's without sin. Jesus even says in a couple chapters later, he says, which one of you convicts me of sin? Right? And he's talking to his enemies. If I said that to one of my enemies, I'd be here all day. <laughs> they couldn't answer Jesus because he didn't have sin. Now think of this. Is this your assessment of Jesus? To you, does he speak the words of God? Does he speak truth? 
Does, do, do you believe that he seeks only the glory of his father and himself is set aside in this sense? And that do you believe that he is true? Do you believe he's sinless, truly sinless without sin? Think of that. The one who comes to that conviction is the one who is willing to do the will of God. You know that because God changed your will, you're willing to obey, and you will obey that which you learned from Jesus. This is what he's saying. To disregard that, to, to, to not be convinced of that in your soul. And, and let me step aside one sec. All of us believe better than we live, <laughs> right? You understand that phrase? But the truth is still the truth and the same, that our life will give evidence that I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Remember, you don't have the option of agnosticism. Oh, I'm not sure. That's to be damned. Listen to John 8. We'll get there. But listen to it anyway. <laughs> 43 through 47. To his opponents, to those who hate him, Jesus says, why do you not understand what I'm saying? I'm speaking... I'm speaking uh, pure Aramaic to you. <laughs> I was going to say English, but he wasn't using English. He says, I'm, I'm speaking Aramaic to you. Why is it you don't understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Why is that? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires or the will of your father. He was a murderer. From the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, Jesus, I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Well, I'm glad you asked. He who is of God... Hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you're not of God. What a bold step on the air hose moment, right? You don't buy what I'm saying, says Jesus, because you're of the devil, right? It's not that I'm unclear. I mean, no one's more clear than God. No one's more clear than Jesus. How come these, these Jewish religious leaders didn't follow him and listen to his word? Not because Jesus was confusing, it's because they were spiritually dead and blind and unwilling to do the will of God. And so they don't understand because they're their father, the devil. So back in chapter 7, the Jews are proving by the rejection of Jesus that they are not willing to do God's will, that they are not right before God. They are religious leaders, think of this, who are frauds, pretenders, and hypocrites. And think of the influence over people they have. They are actually... According to John 7, 28, they are actually ignorant of God experientially. They do not know God, it says in 7, 28. They don't have a relation, a personal, intimate, experiential knowledge, relationship of God. And they're religious leaders who are rejecting the Son. And so they, don't, they do not come to the verdict that his words are from God. We must come to the verdict that his words are from God, all of his words. As much as I want to camp on that, I need to go to the next one real fast. 19 through 23, his works. He moves from words to works. His works are from God. This is a fascinating section too, man. In 19 through 23 here of John, uh, John chapter 7, he will claim his works are from God and in so doing that, he will reveal the Jews' hypocrisy to them in contrast to himself. He will show that they are unwilling to do the will of God because they think they're doing the will of God. He will show them that they are actually unwilling to do the will of God. Therefore, they don't understand Jesus' words. Look at verse 19. He goes to Moses, their hero. 
the lawgiver in verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yes, he did. Moses, who they claim to be disciples of Moses. They profess themselves to be doers of the law. They're, they're the protectors of Torah, so they say. The J- Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter here with such precision, such boldness, which is really grace, and he calls them out. He calls out their hypocrisy. And isn't it awesome? Jesus knows every heart of every person. He knows fully the hearts of those who are in his presence there. He knows all of our hearts, right? And he knows that the ones standing before them in verse 19, because he knows all hearts, notice what he knows about them in verse 19. And none of you carries out the law. And the word carries out is the same verb that's used up here in verse 17, to do. So it's like this, none of you does the law. Verse 17, if anyone's willing to do the will of God, he will know the truth. He says in verse 19, didn't Moses give you the law? Yes, he did. They're proud of that. We receive the truth. We're we're the protectors of the truth. We do the law. And yet Jesus confronts them and says, and none of you does the law. All have sinned, eh? Nobody does the law perfectly. The purpose of the law was to show us our sin and point us to Jesus. But he confronts them because they said they are doers of the law. And so he's going to nail them, fillet them, and open them up, which gives them an opportunity to be rescued. This is grace, even though he's nailing them. Look at what he says in verse 19. How are we not doing the law? They don't say it on the text here, but look at his answer in the end of verse 19. Why do you seek to kill me? Hey, They've been seeking to kill him since a year, a year and a half earlier, back in John chapter 5. And he says to them, none of you does the law, and here's the proof of it. You're breaking the sixth commandment. You want to kill me. An innocent person, he says. An innocent person. So they're actually, the ones who are accusing him of breaking the law, they're actually breaking the law themselves because they're seeking to kill an innocent man. This is the proof of their hypocrisy. This is amazing. And Jesus nails them. And then the view shifts in verse 20. Notice it goes to the crowd. The crowd answered. So there's different peoples in the surroundings of Jesus. And and the Pharisees are there challenging him. And then there's those in uh, in the crowd listening to this in fascinating conversation and teaching. And in verse 20, they look at what they, their assessment of Jesus is this based on his statement. Why do you seek to kill me? In verse 20, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Can you imagine calling the Son of God demonic? <laughs> Fallen man is blinded, man. Here's, here's, only, here's a person that only speaks the truth, and they say he has a demon. That's, that's fallen man's assessment apart from grace, right? Jesus is demonic. They think he's lost his mind. Who seeks to kill you? Perhaps they weren't aware or they're just denying. I'm not sure which it is, but perhaps because they're of the crowd and not the leaders, maybe they're not aware yet of the leader's intentions. I don't know. But the point is, Jesus knows. And they say, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Look at verse 21, please. He says here, his works are from God. And in answer to their mockery and their scoffing and their just rude You're demonic. In verse 21, notice what he says. Jesus answered them. He doesn't even pay attention to that statement. And he says, I did one deed in verse 21, and you marvel. I did one deed, and you marvel. You all marvel. Well, the deed, the work, literally, that he's referencing, obviously goes back to John 5, when he healed the invalid who was in that condition for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda and he healed him and he had the audacity to have the man that he healed roll up his pallet, his mat, and pick it up and carry it. And that was more than the Jews could handle because that broke their Sabbath rules. But Jesus is saying in verse 21, I did one work and you marvel. Now the marvel isn't so much 
that Jesus healed, that's what it should have been. They should have been in awe that they saw a man healed. But they're marveling that Jesus had the audacity to have that man pick up his pallet and walk during the Sabbath. And that was prohibited by their man-made laws. They're astonished at that. But he validates his claims here now that his works are from God and that he's not a lawbreaker by drawing a parallel in verses 22 through 23. Look at this here. Verse 22, for this reason. For what reason? There's a lot of debate, a lot of, kill, a lot of trees killed on this phrase here. Where does it go? What is he meaning? Uh, maybe I'll only kill a bush, maybe. Um, I'm just going to say it and you can deal with it, right? I think it's referring, and I think you'll see my argument here. I think it's referring to what he said in verse 21. For what reason? For the reason that I healed. That's the deed in verse 21, work. The work that he did, okay? The one deed that he did in, back in chapter five that he's referencing here is that he restored to health completely a man who was invalid. And I think it's his, not only his whole body, but perhaps his soul. He saved him and he made him well. And so he healed him, restored him perfectly. It was for this reason, verse 22, that Moses gave to the Jews, look what it says, circumcision. Interesting, what a strange right to put here in this text. But get this. He's referencing a healing and says in 22, for this reason, Moses gave you circumcision. And then he goes to parentheses in the middle of 22. Notice what he says. And he's going he's gonna to kind of put Moses down a notch or two. Rightly so. He says, not because it is from Moses. Circumcision is not from Moses, but from the fathers. And the fathers referencing there takes us back to Genesis 17. And Abraham was given this right by, Yahu- by God as a sign of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? And the promises that are included in the Abrahamic covenant of, of, of a people for God. And, um, and, and we, notice, we know from Galatians that uh, Christ is the seed to whom the promises were made. The, the sign of the covenant circumcision was a sign of faith of the parents to show this child that they should look forward to the promises of God, of restoration redemption. It's an it's a interesting thought here, but follow my thought, please. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. That's parallel to the, to the healing deed in 21. Not because it's from Moses, but it's from the fathers. Abraham is about 400 years before Moses, okay? So that circumcision right precedes the law of Moses, the end of verse 22, notice what he's, what he's going here. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. So you keep the covenant rite of circumcision because the, adult, the, the male child was to be circumcised on the eighth day. And when that eighth day landed on the Saturday Sabbath of the Jewish calendar... They did not postpone it to the next day. They fulfilled what the law said to do with circumcision on the eighth day. But according to their argument of getting after Jesus, Jesus is saying, based on your argument against me, you guys break the Sabbath every time you keep that Abrahamic circumcision. Okay? But the Abrahamic circumcision, according to this argument here, was a sign of something greater to happen far as the restoration of the whole person. Look at what it says in verse 23. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, that's the lesser. Look at the second half of verse 23. Are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? So the circumcision right had this symbolic pointing to something future of a fuller restoration, a promise in the Abrahamic covenant. Moses 
commands it in the law. So then to keep the covenant of Abraham and that sign on the eighth day when it lands on the Sabbath, they would go through and do circumcision on the Sabbath so they wouldn't break the Sabbath. Jesus says, okay, I healed the whole man. I did what the circumcision points to. I fulfill the Old Testament right that was given to Abraham and to the Jews. I fulfill it in that I restore the whole person. All that God intends in the Abrahamic promises. All that's going to happen in the future, in the future kingdom, in a resurrected, glorified new body and restoration. I am con- I'm the one who fulfills that. I healed this whole man here of which circumcision was a sign and a point or two and you do it and you, and you break the Sabbath according to your argument. Are you getting after me mad enough to kill me because I am the fulfillment of what you are doing? Do you see his argument? He says, this is really insane. And that's why he goes to 24 and commands them and commands us then to this, right? Stop judging according to your eyes. Stop judging by superficial, shallow appearances that you don't really understand or have knowledge and you make rash decisions. Don't reject Christ because you've misinterpreted what he's doing by your eyes. The the command, the second command in verse 24 is, but I want you to judge always righteously. I want you to see the, the truth of what's happening before you and make a right decision. Don't reject Christ from a shallow, arrogant resistance that you really don't understand. And so... When he commands them there in verse 24, he's commanding us as well, isn't he? He's, so I'm going to say in finishing this, as Jesus laid out before them, his claims demand a verdict. Do you believe his words are from God and absolutely true? If so, how do you show that in your life today? When you leave here, do you show that you have come to the verdict that the words that Jesus says is true? Is your life governed by his word? Are you in submission to his lordship? Are you, if you've come to the verdict that he's God and the words that he speaks are God and the words that he does are from God, do you show it by your submission to him? Do you show it by going out there and telling others that they too should come to this Jesus. Take him at his word. Trust him. He is worthy of all praise. He is is the fulfillment of what God has promised. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life, the way and the truth. He is who he says he is. His words are absolutely faithful, absolutely reliable, absolutely true. Do you trust him? That's an everyday life. Do I trust him in my home? Do I trust him in my work? Do I trust him when I'm driving down the the way? Do I trust him when I'm suffering? Do I trust him when things are awesomely blessed? Do I trust him every way in between? If I don't, then I'm actually denying what I say. He is who he says he is. He is God in flesh who's come to speak the words of God. I'm going to close with the testimony of heaven. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. They're talking about Jesus. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth, on the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, Jesus, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Thank you, Father, for your word. Help us to come to the right verdict to assess your claims righteously that your words 
are true and from heaven and your works are not contrary to you but in perfect harmony and proof that you are who you say you are. Help us to trust you, Lord Jesus. Forgive us when we doubt and struggle in unbelief. I ask that you would have mercy upon us and you would help us to walk by faith. We give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.